about it's a you know unique sound, okay? but it's one of those unique sounds that in the early part of the 21st century that also reminds one of many many other things. Mm -hmm. Like you know, so many people can come to it and they can bring their own light on what it reminds them of. Mm -hmm. In, in I guess you know sometimes a positive way, sometimes a negative way. But I'm, you know, there's so many reference points are thrown at you. You know, mm -hmm. whether it's Cat Power, Mazzy Star, or the Slits, or yep. you know whatever. But I just wondered, in terms of your own imagination, when you come to make the music, you know, was there was there something you were going for? And, and as is often the case with great pop groups, you get it wrong, but out of that you create your own sound. You can make those comparisons, but it never mm. felt like it was. What were yours? It was. Um, I thought it was pretty proggy. Mm -hmm. So I first thought yes, and then I found out that. That Emily used to listen to Yes a lot. Ah. When, um, That's very interesting because, in terms younger. of the credible references that are made, there's always been a very narrow blogosphere reference point, if mm -hmm. you like. Bands like that wouldn't get mentioned, would no. they? You know, mm -hmm. so it's kind of it, because that's probably makes sense of the length of the songs as well, which yeah, sort of busts totally. through what the yeah. um, uh, expected length. And there's of these so many kind of different songs. faces to mm. every song as well, which mm. I thought was really interesting. I love that element of mm. music where it's the perfect blend of emotion and cerebral mm -hmm. and. Um, I think that that um, classification or whatever usually comes from external yeah. forces, yeah, which yeah. isn't a bad thing at all. Mm. I do the same thing when mm. I hear a band and someone says, you know, oh, what would this go well with? Mm. Or how will it fit into my record collection? Everyone has a different function mm. for music. Some people really enjoy, you know, um, chronicling the, the lineage or the influence of mm. something of, of a great deal of bands or one particular moment in history. So that's there's like a joy in that it's historical or something so people really like to reference mm. different bands mm. because it makes sense to them oh i really like this mood about bands like cocteau twins mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. massive attack or mm -hmm. something like that mm. i also like this kind of mood which is mm. a little more aggressive mm. you know which is like caius or something like that so people really it's like catering to your mood so mm. people will say oh this is something that's different that's coming to your consciousness that you can classify in this mood, which mm. is really nice. You have a control over it, mm. you know? It's, I think, like, in most cases, people feel very comfortable in any situation being able to identify with something. So it's mm. like, if it's unknown, that's scary. It's scary yeah. to every human. So it's like, yeah. oh, you know what? Well, it sounds like it's like a natural thing. You can't really help it. So you're like, mm -hmm. oh, it sounds like this. I do it, too. I'm like, mm. oh, it sounds like this. Sounds like yeah. I want to know that I know what that sounds like. And it's... That's like a and if it's coming soothing. from a similar place as well. Yeah, yeah, even though I wouldn't go, oh, they're trying, it's not coming from a negative place, like mm. they're trying to be that. But in my head, if I can identify it with something, that makes me feel comfortable, like it validates mm. my existence somehow. That's, that's interesting why there's a lot of groups at the moment, their music is, is very hesitant. It's, it's almost breaking down, it's depleted to an extent. Mm -hmm. And there's also all these ghostly references, sometimes literally with you, of pop history. And I wonder what it's like being young, moving into pop music now, that's so loaded with um, reference points and memories and, and scenes and genres and a narrative that's now 50, 60 years old. If that's, it's almost like you're withdrawing from it, yet acknowledging this history. And I find that quite, quite interesting, that tantalizing sense of of, of something almost that you're, you're nostalgic for, but you're nostalgic for something that you weren't around when it happened. Yeah, I wonder really if that plays into the music as well. I think that kind of happens with anyone at any point. It's just so accelerated at, at right now because there's so much, there's such a bulk of, of you know, experience mm. at this point that you can delve into at your leisure. There's so many bands that even if one band has never heard of, say, Kraftwerk, they could sound exactly like Kraftwerk, mm. you know? Mm. So in that way, it's, it's difficult. It's definitely more difficult to do something unique, but there's also this charm of everybody can make music now. Mm. So everybody, someone who is really pure and innocent, who is not just on this train of mainstream music and gets signed to a record label and whatever and gets pushed into another classification or something, so everything is just kind of fragmented. Mm. It, um, it's definitely now there's more of an opportunity for someone to be, to ignore whatever mm. happened previous to, mm -hmm. their, to their making music. Mm. Um, so I think it's too, it's double-sided. Is there also an element at the age you are where you're actually influenced by the, the, the music that your parents played? Which in oh, a way is a yeah, new thing. You know, sure. once bands started and Absolutely. they wouldn't be influenced by their parents' music, where now 
that surely yeah. was the key thing yeah. you were brought up with. Yeah, I think it's more more now because we can really enjoy our parents' music as well. Coming into your twenties or mm. your thirties or whatever, that you start to relate to that. Like you, you love mm -hmm. Paula Notes and, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and I love Steely Dan. Those things were so dorky to me when mm. I was first growing up, but now acknowledging that just I don't know. It seems there's there's so much that you're your past can offer you, you know, and there's a nostalgia to it that mm. gets more potent yeah. as you get older as mm. well. You know, oh, I remember that when I was four years old, my parents used to play that record or something. And then it always slips in in some way to the way that you make music or the things yeah. that you relate to in music. Well, Even if you don't think it in that moment, you're just no. like, well, I can't mm. actually help it because my musical library, you know, is quite large and it goes back to when I was two years old. And mm -hmm. so you're 22, or I'm 22 years old and making up a bass line and that mm. could be influ influenced or inspired by something I was listening to when I was three or, yeah. you know? Mm. I guess that's what I would say. Going like, back to your other question, did we, um, was there ever like a plan to sound like anything mm. or what are we, you know, mm. influenced by? And I think um, just ha growing up and being inspired by all kinds of music and at least for me, I know that I, I was like, you know, I'm going to, I'm gonna play bass. I'm the bass player in the band. I, I, you know, I want I want things to move and I want them to be dancey. So there's mm. really nothing that there was no other motivation other than that. It wasn't um, there wasn't a specific um, yeah, the, mm. yeah. It wasn't it wasn't thought out or okay. I want to write a bass line like yeah. you know this or that. It was just you know what is, I wanted. Is, is, is there no strategy as well? I, I sometimes wonder if one of the advantages you have in, in your generation that, that is interesting is you can imagine different chron chronologies. Mm. So you can imagine say Crosby, Stills, Nash and Long as if they've been influenced by the raincoats. Mm. You, know, you know what I mean? You can put things together in a different way. You can imagine yeah. what it would have been like if the Cocteau Twins had come after Cat Power. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if there's a little you know the shuffle era, the internet era, you've got yeah. this opportunity to create different imaginary musical narratives. You know. That's really interesting. Yeah. I don't know if I've, I've ever thought about that. Mm. That's really interesting because I'm kind of a little bit OCD about what, about um, the history of music as well. And so I'd like to know what came before yeah, what, yeah, chicken, yeah. you know? Huh? I said the chicken and the Yeah, exactly. But it's really interesting. I guess there are, at least just now, it's bands like, say, the XX, you know, a lot of younger audiences are listening to their music and um, and totally appreciating it, but they might not know about bands mm, mm. like The Cure or Bauhaus or something, mm. or bands that even those guys listen to, mm, you know. Mm. And so it's interesting. Maybe that is that's a good interpretation of that, that it, idea. Is that, it, is, that, it, is, that yeah. is that you're just you're experiencing it as as well, just clean. Yeah. Instead of the whatever came it, before. Is it. that mm. also why you you tend to sound tethered to it, but also like you're floating free? It's like you're just breaking away from it. So you you were very aware of it, as you say, OCD. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, wanted yeah. to know, but you're also trying to break free from it. So you don't want to be yeah. completely wallowing in the past. You want to move forward. So yeah. there's this kind of weird tension that there is of you just wanting to break free. I think it's harder to just leave that kind of stuff as a backseat notion these days, being just how much music came before mm. what you're trying to create. And I think especially with um, songwriters today or any songwriter throughout history, there's always that thing in the back of your mind, like, is this really innovative or mm. is this really new? Is there a mm. point to doing this? Mm. And it's much easier to get caught in that, that heady creation today because there's so many wonderful things that have happened before that mm. totally push the envelope and everything you do now kind of sounds passe. But I just wondered what it was like, you know, to be to, to be at the centre of a weird kind of hype storm, mm. uh, you know, uh, and and how much you can just just push that to one side, you know. I think right now it's very difficult for bands that get caught in that. I'm not just saying just us. Mm. This, I've seen it happen to so many bands that just get so overexposed. Mm. People get sick of them mm. that if they play that game, they it will tire mm. pretty soon. If they enjoy it, if that's one of you know, they, they love to make music, but one of the, one of the other objectives in, in being a band is mm. to reach some kind of infamy. Mm. And so if they, you know, fall into that pool or whatever, like, okay, I'm ready to, to you take me wherever you want, or the audience mm. will take me wherever they, mm. they want to, or the press or whatever, that's, your, that's of your own volition. Mm. That's, you know, you, you have that choice. It's not necessarily that, um, I think it's also quite easy if you mean it, to not be involved in that. Mm. It's not, it, um, there's some things that happen outside of your control, but at the same time there's, you can be selective mm. as well. And I think the more, like there are right now, 
we're always getting emails about, oh, doing this interview or this interview or whatever, but just knowing, okay, where, where, when can we, where do we actually want to say something mm. that's significant as mm. opposed to just being talking heads mm. all the time, talking heads, the concert, not the band. Yeah, yeah. But um, just being that all the time just to get exposure or just to get our face out there so more people can listen to it because luckily now people, there's like not only the word of mouth but the power of the internet and the power of media and stuff mm. that if people want to hear this band, they will be, they have access to it. It's yeah. not under, the, it's not dug under yeah. the sand or whatever. So in terms of all the other stuff, I feel lucky, lucky enough to be, you know, with a record company and with a team and with these girls and, mm. um, you know. It's funny how a, f a moment, a few years, people were saying everything was over and the industry had collapsed. There was no, no use for record labels. In a funny mm -hmm. sort of way, the better, more interesting groups now love the idea of collaborating with a record label and they love the idea of, of an unfolding context for their music. So it mm -hmm. just isn't the music, but there's the things that come with it, the image, the the, the, the reputation, the myth, if you sure. like. Seems yeah, to be but it's also very practical as well as mm. being, yeah. there is like a nice, a wonderful image mm. associated with Rough Trade, but at the mm. same time, logistically and everything, they are so respectful mm -hmm. and mm. they let things unfold the way that they unfold naturally, whereas just being involved with maybe another record label, there might be a little more of a push towards something else or like mm. a bit, bit more of a molding. So mm. in that respect, that's a big, big part of why we can be selective and mm. we can do the things that we want to do. Ciao, Wabo. I often listen to, or at least when I, before I started playing bass, was I was um, really into the melody in the music and not, I wouldn't hear the bass. The bass would be the last thing that I heard. I would hear the melody. Yeah. And so when I started playing bass, I started playing, I, I played very melodically. And I was, my bass lines were, they were melody. There wasn't the root notes or the backbone. It was the melody. So I, it's, it was hard for me as far as like, Who's your favorite bass player? Did it didn't really have. <laughs> what about you, Star? What are your favorite drummers? Um, I really like Greg Saunier, who plays with Deerhoof. Growing up, I was really into Bonham and stuff mm -hmm. like that because that's just the best teacher you can have if you want to play. Kind of tasteful, aggressive, yeah. drumming. Yeah. Um, and Tony Allen, Felicudi's drummer. Mm -hmm. Leave on Helm from the band as well. Yeah, like watching yeah. the last waltz when I was a kid. Yeah, that's yeah. what. I remember just feeling weak at the knees. I'd never felt that about a drummer before. It was always like, oh, I want to do that, or I was so inspired by it. It was just one of those moments watching him um, where I felt like I, no one could ever, ever do what he does because he's such a musician, you know? I like yeah. musical drummers. Yeah.